So you probably know the format already for the next 45 minutes. We're going to have a conversation with um, a brilliant guest. And our guest today is a real polymath. Uh, you could call her a strategist. You could call her an architect. You could call her a writer or a designer. Um, and you'd be right every time. Uh, she was one of the founders, co-founders of Assemble, uh, the Art and Architecture Collective. She's co won is that the right way to say it? The Turner Prize. Um, she's also co won the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture. Uh, she's now an independent practitioner and is someone I've been lucky enough to collaborate with uh, in recent years and months. And her favorite food, her dinner food that we haven't sent her is faux noodles. So today we're having dinner with the brilliant Paloma Strelitz. Uh, Paloma, thank you for joining us. Hi, Naresh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Me too. So Pal Paloma will be sharing with us a starter, um, which is a project at the start of her career that gave her an early break, then a main course, which is a project or two uh, that has helped her define, uh, define her career to date. And then um, lastly, a next meal. So it's a project created by someone else or um, in partnership with someone else that's inspiring her about what creativity can and should be going forward. And um, <clears throat> as Paloma shares her work, uh, you will have questions. I was gonna say, if you have questions, but of course you will have questions, please ask them in the chat window so um, I can put them to Paloma um, between the courses. Um, and those could be questions about her process when creating work, about the themes that unite her work. I know we'll talk a lot about that, about work for, for work that creates social impact, uh, about the experience of being in a collective, about leaving a collective and going on your own and more. Um, so the idea is that we're all having dinner with Paloma. So let's all be in the conversation. So, um, so Paloma, Paloma, can we start at the beginning of your uh, or career or even before the beginning of your career? So can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to architecture? So you studied architecture at the Royal College. So what drew you towards that as a creative practice? I um, actually was, there, there are probably a number of moments which really inspired me. Um, actually, I think one of them was uh, when I was like 16 and I, I actually took part in the National Youth Theatre. So I was a member of the National Youth Theatre. And that year, the, 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 each year they, run, they do residential courses and that one was held at the Laban Centre, which was this amazing building um, in Deptford, which is designed by Herzog and de Muron. Um, and in fact, it just won the Sterling Prize, which is architecture's biggest award. And I just remember being blown away by this building and actually, and blown away by the experience of doing the National Theatre. And there was just like this amazing synergy between kind of being within this space, which was just facilitating like the most extraordinary uh, like experience of kind of drama and acting and theater um, and the setting which made kind of all the difference in the world to it. And I think that was, you know, one of those moments which was really important and like exciting for me about thinking, how do you kind of create the sort of infrastructure or the framework that supports really amazing experiences? Right, so that's what, that's what drew you into wanting to study at the Royal College. Well, I did my undergrad at Cambridge, um, so that's what that drew me to, to doing architecture for my undergrad, which is where I did it. Ah, uh, you did it at Cambridge, right, and then the Royal College, fantastic. And then, um, and so you left the Royal College and then in 2010, you co-founded the wonderful Assemble. No, wrong, wrong timeline, Naresh. Um, <laughs> actually, we did the Cinerolium after Cambridge, so it, we did it, um, our first projects together, the summer after we finished university. Um, oh, I see. So actually, Assemble was kind of up and running by the time I did my MA. Got it, got it. Um, so the wonderful Assemble um, with, um, I think, 17 other founders, is that right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think, I've, I think I've met them all, uh, or most of them, Jane, Annika, Lewis, Fran, James, the rest, uh, and they're all fabulous, I must say. And um, what, what was... Um, what were you looking to achieve when you started that project and why why was the collective the right structure? So um, I'm going to show some slides of scenario, but before that, I think what was really important was that we didn't ever set out to set up a, a design studio, a collective, anything that would be a kind of uh, continuous entity. We had all just finished universities, we'd gone to work in our sort of separate offices, 
And I think we felt um, we just had like an appetite beyond what they were offering. And we were all in different types of organizations. Um, but, you know, obviously when you enter it at a junior level, like you're, you're not in control, you're learning the ropes. And I think we just had like an enormous amount of excitement and energy around what we thought architecture could do. And we really wanted to kind of steer our own ship on something. Mm. So, so it was only ever set up really to do a one-off project. Um, and in fact, we kind of temporarily, before it had an identity, it was sort of temporarily named Reckless Endeavour. Um, right. And, and the idea was just to do a one-off, which would be a vehicle for us to learn and to enjoy and to test ideas. And actually it was only kind of, you know, began to be off the success of that, that we began to look at turning, uh, assemble into a more, um, a more kind of concrete entity. Right. Um, why did, uh, you mentioned Cinerolium, so why didn't you take us through that? Why don't we go into your starter now? Um, so Cinerolium, and then you, I think you, you're gonna show another project as well, is that right? Uh, I'm going to show, uh, yes, I'm going to show Folly for a Flyover, which is our second project as part of my starter as well. Okay, fantastic. Two-part starter. Yeah, so this was our first project and this was the Cinerolium and it was transforming a disused petrol station on Clerkenwell Road into a temporary cinema. Um, and this is really, you know, for us, I think there were so many things which this project was about, but part of it was kind of, you know, just looking for opportunity, looking for a stage and also trying to create something which was, uh, you know, kind of convivial and theatrical and generous and unexpected within the heart of the city. And so we identified there were, it was kind of a time where there, seemed, there were lots of derelict petrol stations. And we thought um, there was this idea of uniting the kind of image of the historic picture palace with the petrol station to bring these two together to create almost like a new typology of like cinema within the city. Um, and so this was kind of the final Cinerolium and what you can kind of really clearly see is the petrol station canopy. Um, and then this sort of enormous festoon silver curtain beneath and then the kind of iconic sign of the Cinerolium above. And if you go onto the next slide, I think this, this sort of shows how we went about the process of, of building the Cinerolium. I mean, we had, we had, you know, very, very limited budget and a lot about this project was kind of around stirring up enthusiasm, trying to get support and buy and getting materials in kind, people lending their expertise because they thought it was a fun thing to get involved in. And, you know, the curtain, which is shown in two of these images is kind of a perfect example of that. Um, we uh, reached out to Tyvek, um, uh, which Tyvek normally uses a roofing underlay, and we sort of sewed it up into these enormous festoon curtains. So it was taking a roofing underlay, but transforming it into something which is sort of, you know, normally treated as if it's a, you know, velvet fabric. And actually we got help from uh, Ken Creasy and also Alistair Flint, both of whom are people who work within the theatre industry. Uh, so people might be familiar with Flint's because they're the kind of primary theatrical Chandler shop in the UK. And so we got support from them, just like working out how to prototype this curtain, how to rig it. You can see us in that kind of portrait image. And that was the first panel. And for us, it was really important that this curtain could have a rise and fall. And so that's us kind of testing the mechanism. And that was something which just sort of played out across all the elements of of the development of this project and a kind of, you know, R&D energy about, uh, could we do this? And this, here's a bit of an idea, you know, how, how might we get that done? So the image in the left-hand corner is in fact, a homemade vacuum former using heat guns to kind of melt the perspex sheeting. Um, oh. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was really a spirit of experimentation and seeing what we could achieve. And then the, the result was, which shows Amazing. the kind of the inside of the cinema during a screening. And so we ran the cinema for a month um, and uh, in fact, show? the old petrol station shop was turned into a bar. So we ran a bar there um, and people, that was basically the foyer and people would kind of process out from the foyer into the cinema. And then it was kind of uh, programmed to be uh, 
like you know films which really embrace the idea of like the road or the journey so everything from uh you know jewel to barbarella um and and once you like at a screening it felt like you were in quite a sort of self-contained space that you could kind of get the peripheral sounds but really you were in an interior um and then at the end of the screening and if you go on to the next slide the cut we would raise the curtain so you're suddenly exposed to the street and visible to passers-by and mm. it was kind of this moment where from being the spectator you became the spectacle yeah. and it was just a really you know joyful experience and it was really about us learning the language of this thing that we've been taught for three years and kind of working out how we could use it and have fun with it and make sense of it and this was kind of you know our first stage to do that it's such an it's such an inspiring reimagination exercise it's really really fantastic um a question from um a question from elena is um what do you given that that was turning a disused space into a space with use um what what do you think can be done about empty spaces um now that so many shops are closing in town centers i mean do you is that is that thinking is some version of that thinking valid in, in our current situation do you think i mean i think it is a hundred percent valid there are so many opportunities for reinvention and i think one thing that's really interesting about um you know a future of the high street is that actually there are things which which perhaps have not historically had visibility because high street frontages have been expensive but actually like really interesting and vital um and that and that if um if high street spaces become more accessible actually i think there's a really uh, interesting opportunity for a kind of reconfiguration of the high street mm. where things such as you know i don't know nurseries or um or, or workspaces or craft spaces or, you know, just things which normally would sit in the kind of back of house, you know, back of city can become to the forefront, become more visible. And I think that would be a really, um, you know, positive way to think about how the high street could be kind of transformed. Yeah. Um, and how did you, how did you and your colleagues assemble, or that was just pre, slightly pre-assemble, wasn't it? How did you, how did you decide on projects like that? and um, the next one you're going to show. How, what was your decision making? What was your criteria? Yeah, it's really hard to know. I, I think that we always knew that we wanted it to be something which existed in a like very public context, mm. um, something that could be kind of, uh, so, so that it, you know, it always had to be public. And I think there was a sense of, you know, creating something which probably had an element of event to it, something which could sort of stir excitement mm -hmm. um, and could be a kind of a, a special experience. And I think it was relatively early on that someone identified, uh, you know, this opportunity around petrol stations and it kind of just seemed like such a great one uh, that why, why wouldn't you run with that? And at that point it kind of became a question of uh, trying to like broker an opportunity. Um, and so we, you know, we approached uh, various owners of these sites and, um, you know, amazingly, the person who owned this site in Clark and Well Road said, you know, I'll give you the keys as long as I'm not liable for anything that goes <laughs> on in it. And we, we, you know, we promised it would be very responsible and he, he remarkably gave us permission to use the site. Yeah, well, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing project and... Uh... Um, you didn't show an image of um, it as a pretzel station just now, did you? That's no, also, I didn't show it. I didn't the before show it. is also just tremendous, but it's yeah. um, it's um, it's out there. It's out there on the great mm -hmm. wide world internet. Um, if anyone wants to see it, um, Isabel's asking, um, what was your design process? So um, I guess it's to go into that last question a little bit more. Um, and she's asking, you know, is it was it all was it all about being experimental? Is that how you is that how you went into projects? I think, you know, the scenario was, was kind of quite a long time ago for us now, but I think the main thing was that we had, we had a vision and that vision was very much as that first image shows, this canopy, the rate seating beneath the canopy and the sign. And I think that's what we had from the beginning. And from there, there was still an enormous amount of um, kind of question and process and detail that was not determined 
Um, but we kind of knew where we were trying to get to. And then that was that kind of set us on a critical path. And, and particularly, I haven't shown images of things like the, the bar and the foyer, but, but there were so many elements to this experience from, you know, designing furniture for the foyer to designing the tickets to designing the website. Like every part of this experience was, was thought through, but it wasn't thought, thought through beforehand. It became a, from that perspective, though, it was very much a site of experience. Uh, experimentation and opportunity and people kind of taking on the task of various elements and seeing where they got to and I you know I can't remember any of those which sort of fell by the wayside but I'm sure there were some um, and everyone kind of had probably you know what became in a way sort of subset mini projects within the project as a whole and the mm. other thing was that we got a lot of volunteer support and participation and so uh, the cinema seats were made from scaffold boards and we had these manuals which showed people how to build them and so we sort of set up these kind of production lines and people got involved for a few hours to help out um, and so a lot of it was from that perspective about making a process accessible to us because we'd actually never built anything before and then accessible to others both for the joy of it and because it also helped us kind of achieve the vision. Fantastic. Were you con were you were you consciously making a piece of architecture? Was it a piece of art? Was it an experience? Was it an intervention? What what were you what what were you actually creating in your minds? I think I think it started with us thinking about this as a architecture project, but I think very quickly we realised that it's much more multifaceted. Right. Um, like not least when we realized we had to run it, <laughs> um, which somehow we didn't factor in until quite late, but there was kind of this enormous uh, like process of working out how that was gonna happen given that we all had full-time jobs. So we'd sort of, you know, we had these sort of evenings on a week where we sort of have to rush off. I don't even remember quite how it works, but we were all working full-time. So yeah, we'd have to sort of rush there on evenings when there were screenings and set up. And um, I think the theatre and the performance of it was always really evident. Another picture that I didn't show was the costumes that we had, but there's an artist called Samara Scott who kind of made us these uh, like um, kind of retro uh, cinema outfits um with again with like Tyvek and sandpaper and there are these hats and bibs and Doesn't like question. really it was just about us I think those elements of it were partly about the theatre and trying to create something which felt like a real occasion and event and surprise for people who came to it. Fantastic um should we go into starter part two? Um, yeah so there's a, so yes that'd be great. So there's just one slide for this, but this was our second project, which was Folly for a Flyover. And I was really keen to bring this in because Naresh, you and I were talking about ideas. And I was saying that I think that one thing that felt quite important to me about lots of our projects were that they're about democratizing access, democratizing knowledge, um, trying to kind of open the doors of experiences which can otherwise be uh, kind of privileged or, or you know, just hard to access. And so this project's Folly for a Flyover and it was transforming a uh, undercroft um, an, of a motorway in Hackney Wick into this temporary performance venue. And so it was built the summer before the Olympics and this side of site overlooks the canal and it was sort of turning this site of no use or, you know, occasional misuse into again this kind of surreal setting for community activity and unlike this inerolium which was 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 about this one much more holistically um there were sort of uh programs that were run over an eight-week period throughout the daytime and the kind of the key thing was that we partnered with the barbican so the barbican had approached us after this inerolium and said you know, would you, we really love that project, would be kind of maybe interested in doing something with you in, you know, three years time, um, and we could have a pot of money for it at that point. And we thought, no, that's sort of not reflective of where we are now, but we were already exploring this project. In fact, I think we were already going to, we weren't, well, no, we weren't when we had the first conversation with Barbican, but we were really, we had, I think, identified the site and kind of trying to find a project for the site. And so we, we said, what might be much better is to work out what you could share with us, you know, in the next year, rather than kind of give us 
funding further down the line. And so they were doing this exhibition, which was called Watch Me Move, A History of Animation. And so there are going to be all these sort of set, you know, uh, areas of the exhibition from sort of fables to superheroes. And actually, we thought that, that could sort of sync really well with the project that we were envisaging for this site. And so, and Folly for a Flyover kind of imagines an alternative narrative for this site whereby someone built a house and the motorway had to pass in order to accommodate it. So it's a bit like those images of nail houses in China. And then brilliantly, what the Barbican kind of helped us with is was the programming. So it became so clear that each week we would have a, a theme tied to one of the themes of the exhibition. So I think we did start with fables. And then, for example, one of the first performances was um, a screening of like Lottie Reiniger's uh, puppet shows alongside uh, a you know a, a recital with the Gamelan Orchestra, um, and so that there were these opportunities for kind of live performances interplayed with cinema, and then doing kind of you know uh, workshops in the day which engaged more young people and families, and it was I thought just a really I thought that partnership was a really good example of how you can kind of take some really carefully crafted content from a kind of, you know, specialist domain that exists, you know, in many ways behind closed doors and bring it out into the open so that so many people can enjoy, you know, all that work that's already gone into kind of composing it. And so for me, it's really about like, how do you share content and how can the city be this kind of platform for making ideas, and experience is more accessible. I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a very clear link between those two projects. I mean, they're both really wonderful projects, I have to say, sort of, uh, you know, I said reimagining re before, and it, there it is again. I mean, just quickly, why did you call it folly? What's the folly part? Why, why is it folly for a flyover? Well, I suppose so, so many people like to be like, but follies don't have functions and your one had a function, but obviously a folly is a structure, which, you know, I suppose typically exists in a landscape without is, and is there for stylistic reasons and without any formal function. But um, I guess there was an enjoyable word play there, which perhaps we uh, took advantage of. Bit of alliteration, yeah. Did you, um, um, a good question from Mona, um, did you start, the collective with funds uh was it self-funded or was it reaching out to various organizations and what would you recommend for creatives freshly out of university to be able to do projects on this scale I yeah it's really, so this it's really well said from mona because i think that you know these are so impressive these are so sort of um these are such large sort of city interventions that you've created you know they're very impressively physical uh, very uh, substantial so how does how does one do that um fresh out of uni so the cine, we didn't the Cinerolium, um at the time we did the Cinerolium, there was a charity that was called Ideas Tap, which I don't think exists anymore. And it was a place where uh, like young creatives could write grants for very, you know, for small amounts of money with very few, you know, strings attached. And so I think we got it was either four or five thousand pounds from them to do the Cinerolium. Um, we each put in fifty pounds, and uh, and the rest was um, then that, that 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 was the resources that we started with. So we uh, we sold tickets. Tickets were, I think, five pounds each. Um, we ran a bar, so we knew that we were going to get some income from the project, and that was going to be enough to cover our costs. And we did, as I said, also get an awful lot of support in kind. And that was really helped for us having, I think, a clear vision for this project. And it was really easy to kind of, I think we found it pretty easy to drum up excitement. And that meant that it became easier to get things like the curtain material, uh, you know, at cost or, uh, or for free. Um, but so it was kind of a, a patchwork from that perspective. We certainly didn't make money from the project and, and we didn't pay ourselves, but we, you know, all did it in our in our summer holidays, basically. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of, you know, it was free from the constraints of trying to set up a practice. And actually, I think that was a really good thing about it. I don't think had we tried to set up a practice where we had a sustainable economic model from our first project that would have been something we even dreamed of contemplating but kind of creating this sort of 
space that existed whilst we all had full time jobs, where, which was really for us at the time just a testing space, um, which was free from some of those constraints was unbelievably valuable and kind of that journey to sustainability was a much slower one which then kind of began to um you know has evolved over time financial financial stability yeah sustainability yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i i really i really agree with what you're saying and uh um just my my thought back to mona is that i think just from my experience in doing projects with do the green thing and other um other similar um some similar types of work is when when a project has a social dimension uh you know, it, 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 you tend to be able to, uh, you get much more help in kind. Um, people want to join in and really help do something that's good for, um, you know, uh, uh, the greater good beyond the commercial agenda. So that, that is definitely one way to actually do something a little bit more significant than you otherwise think you might be able to. Um, should we go into, um, is it time for a main course? Are you hungry? I think so. Okay, so let's, um, what, I know you've got a couple of projects um, lined up here. So why don't you go into your first? Well, the first is um, just this idea of working practice. And actually, Mona, maybe it also begins to kind of pick up on your question, which is this idea of evolution. So we've established a way of, you know, a mode of working, which we really enjoyed by those first two projects. But, you know, we certainly didn't have a studio, we didn't have a stable home. And so that became the next project, like, how could we create a home for ourselves. And actually, you know, again, to sort of maybe pick up on the question that you were asking, um, at that point we had this kit, which was the Cinerolium kit. And so we kind of, we felt that that was an offer for someone. And so we basically created a propositional document which said, you know, we want to set up a creative studio space. Um, we can kind of offer to set up what could be some form of community cinema and run a program of events. And that became a way of having conversations both with councils and uh, you know, landlords and developers around availability that they might have. And so we ended up in uh, Stratford uh, uh, you know, at the site called Sugar House Studios, um, which was kind of always, which was sort of going to be a, meanwhile use so I think we, we had it for five, about five years in the end and it was basically part of a much bigger development site so it was waiting redevelopment and it was a set of warehouses and also a big yard um, and and it took us a while also to, to work out what this space meant for us and at first we thought about it just as our home with the public program much in the way that you know the Cinerolium had this public program but actually over time we realized that it was you know much better used building a community for ourselves and for other people. And so it evolved into this kind of uh, creative workspace, which we uh, also rented, you know, rented out affordably to other people. So there are, you know, there are craftsmen and producers and designers and people who bring a whole range of skills of which we ourselves don't have, but which really have great synergies with the work that we were doing. And so we were able to um, work with them. And the kind of culmination of like this, this project in the site was that was Yard House, which was this kind of prototype for uh, like new build affordable workspace. And again, it was kind of this idea of elevating, you know, a set of uh, a set of sort of functions and disciplines which often get relegated to you know really back of the city spaces and trying to create a platform for them to be celebrated and for us it just created this sort of wonderful surreal backdrop for our you know everyday workings and you know and also occasional events so this was one of the open studios events at the um, at the sugar house in stratford fantastic fantastic um are you are you aware at this stage um of how conscious of you are you of the consistency between your projects do you are you are, are you aware of your themes are are they surfacing as you go? I think that there have been themes which have been very consistent throughout. And I think there's also a kind of quite a strong shared ethos, um, but it's not always clear what those mean. So one example would be ideas, you know, there've been a, there are a lot of ideas about how you give people agency to shape the world around them. Mm. And, you know, self-build is one example of that. And, you know, our first projects did start as self-build projects. We built, we built them. And that felt really fundamental to that experience. But as we evolved, we started questioning what that meant, 
you know, for us, like it was clear that if we were going to grow as a studio, we weren't going to be able to build all our projects ourselves. And actually also, you know, people didn't necessarily want to, people had different, you know, thematic interests. And so I think a good example of that was Black Horse Workshop, which is this big maker space we set up in Walthamstow. And that's in a converted warehouse. And in a way that as, as an infrastructure, it was not self-build at all. Um, but the thing that enables is for people, you know, to engage in, you know, learning woodwork, learning metalwork. And so the infrastructure enables, enables forms of kind of agency and learning and education, but the, the building itself wasn't that project. And so I think that's an example of a kind of question that we have often asked, um, which is like, where does, uh, where do some of these ideas sit within projects as they happen? And there's certainly was has always been the case that they sit in very you know in different places yeah yeah i think um um seeing the the the, the space you built for yourself and your collective i think it'd be nice to just dig a little bit deeper into the idea of a collective if you don't mind sure. uh, um you know um one of the other trustee well rebecca wright who's one of the um deans of csm and she's next year's dnad president she she said to me that her students at uh, CSM were super interested in the idea of a collective. Um, and, uh, um, you know, a, a while back, I, I, I was also responsible for co-founding a form of a collective, uh, uh, um, which was St. Luke's, which was um, a cooperative, actually. And for us, it felt um, we were, I think, having set it up, we were very somewhat surprised by how much more work it was. You know, there's a a need for accountability, um, giving people a sense of involvement, clarity, transparency. Um, but there was also a big upside, which was that um, people were very committed. Um, and I think we got, I think the work really um, benefited us as, as a result. And partly because we were a collective, I think we were also committed to very sort of social work. It was sort of the, the nature of the beast a little bit. Um, and so there were sort of downsides and upsides. And I wondered if you you know, challenges and advantages, I guess, and what challenges and advantages you you found of being part of the collective? Yeah, I think what you say really resonates. I think that there have been, there were amazing advantages. I think just the singular fact of getting so much further together than we would have ever got by ourselves. Um, you know, I look at the Cinerolium as our first project and can't contemplate, you know, that was an that was a serious collective achievement. You know, it would have been a very different world if one of us had set out to do that. Yeah. And I think that's when it's always been at the best, when like together we've been able to achieve more. And obviously people have uh, different skill sets, um, different interests, bring different, you know, qualities to projects. And that had been, that's been really valuable. And I think there's also been real value in you know, really working out how to work together. I mean, whether you're in a collective or not, so much of work is around collaboration. And, um, you know, it can be remarkably easy and remarkably trying. And learning how to get better at it is like a process of a lifetime. I'm sure, you know, everyone would agree. Never, a never ending process. A never, no, it is never. And, you know, and so, and so to kind of be engaging proactively with that and thoughtfully all the time is really interesting. And I think maybe being in a collective makes you more conscious of those, some of those things earlier than if you were, you know, uh, you know, more junior person in office where you're effectively waiting to receive construct, you know, instruction. And that it just meant that very early on we were thinking, how are we going to get this done? And how are we going to do this better? And what's coming next? And what mechanisms do we need to get there? And also there are a lot of people here. And there are a lot of people with like great ideas and loud voices. Like, how do we, uh, you know, how do we moderate that so that everyone has a voice and that, um, you know, not not you know not one perspective dominates. And so, how do we kind of try and work at creating a culture where you know ideas are shared constructively, um, where we're trying to like build up the potential of what projects can be and and really achieved the most. And I think, you know, I, and so I think that's been, that's been a lot, that was always a lot of the joy of, of, you know, of Assemble and kind of being in this 
I think what could often be a very thoughtful process of, you know, mm. how do we work and how do we work better? Yeah. Um, Mona's, Mona's asked a, 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 a really interesting question again, actually, which is how do you find the right people to form a collective with? Um, and is it better to approach people only based on their work or do you, or how well you interact with them, for example, friends or peers? So yeah, it's, is it about their ability? Is it about their character? Is it about some shared set of values or an agenda? How do you pick? How do you pick? Well, your it's, it's an interesting question. You know, that's in many ways not a process that we went through with Assemble because mm. we started with a group of people who were peers, like most of us had studied together. We did, you know, like each other and trust each other, but we weren't trying to set up it wasn't with the, you know, we weren't trying to set up a practice, as I said. And so, and so we didn't go through that process ever. Um, and so, you know, what would you, what would you do if you were to do it from scratch? You know, I think there's, that's a really interesting question. I, I think it's really, really useful to understand what your um, distinct skills are. I think it's really great if you all know that you're bringing something different to the table. Um, I think it would be, it's really good to try to understand why you all want to be part of this process. You know, what are all your expectations? They're probably different. Um, and trying to understand those and trying to align them, I think is a really great thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. I have, you know, I don't, I think these things are about trust and there are lots of different ways that you can build trust that can be with people you already know, but that can be with people that you don't know, but who, you know, bring something which you see as like distinct and valuable. So I don't think there are singular answers on that, but obviously you want to, you know, you want it to be, it can be stressful and at its best, it's really rewarding and enjoyable. And I think you want to I think feel like you're setting out on a journey just with people who you find inspiring, interesting, and you know value working with. Yeah, well, M Mona, I think you're clearly thinking very hard about starting something up right now. So um, I think that's fantastic advice from Paloma. Um, Paloma, can you show us um, Granby? So, um, so this is the project for which Assemble won the Turner Prize. And um, that's not how it started at all. It started in um, us working with the Community Land Trust in Liverpool. And so they're called Grand Before Streets Community Land Trust. And basically they're a community group who um, were very active in Toxteth um, from the kind of, uh, you know, following the wake of the Toxteth riots, which were basically, uh, you know, uh, race riots or uprisings, which happened in the 80s. And after that period, the area went into a kind of state of managed decline. And there were, you know, and there were sort of multiple factors which affected that. For example, Liverpool was a shrinking city and there were, was a strategy uh, called Pathfinders, which was to reduce uh, housing stock in the city by demolishing neighbourhoods. And this was one of the uh, neighbourhoods earmarked for demolition. Um, and so really sort of, you know, a sort of sequence of very destructive planning moves over a series of decades and a kind of community who always lived there who are kind of passionate to save this neighbourhood and had been working many for many years by the time we were introduced to them. Our role became to create a kind of alternative master plan for this neighbourhood, to mm. create a vision which would say to the council, stop demolishing. If you don't want these buildings, hand them to the Community Land Trust, who will develop them um, and hold them in perpetuity as affordable homes for the neighbourhood. And that was kind of one element of this, what was a kind of multifaceted pro uh, process and a series of ideas for how you could rebuild the infrastructure of this neighbourhood, you know, with a kind of cornerstone in terms of affordable housing, but then hopefully, you know, growing and looking at culture and the high street and um you know and and uh, enterprise and a whole sort of suite of ideas but the real aim with that master plan was that it could kind of think at a local scale and that it didn't present a single uncompromising vision but could kind of evolve over time as uh you know opportunities arose and we go on to the next slide 
the first, you know, our first um, part of realizing that project was the delivery of, uh, of these affordable homes, so the renovation of these homes. And as part of that, there have been this kind of craft process to bring back, you know, some sort of sense or sensibility of the elements, the those sort of Victorian domestic elements, which have been stripped away as buildings had deteriorated over the years. And so that sort of project was already in play when we were nominated for the Turner Prize. And there was this kind of question about how we would use this opportunity, which we had never thought that we would have, which is this enormous national platform, um, both to, you know, to show an idea. And, and we really wanted to think about what could, what could be born from that opportunity. And so one of the ideas that had been kind of almost like, you know, identified from that early master plan document was this idea around social enterprise. And so um, we were really interested in the idea of trying to set up a sustainable enterprise via the Turner Prize. And so the image on the left shows a showroom um, during the exhibition, and that was the launch of Brambi Workshop and this idea mm. of launching a company that could produce um, uh, architectural ceramics could be both used in the refurbishment of the buildings of projects that we were doing in Granby, but could also create an identity for a new venture, which could uh, be uh, about, you know, local employment, uh, you know, craft-based production, but could also be, you know, a, a way to, um, a sustainable enterprise, and so, which could grow. And so the image on, uh, in the middle shows Granby Workshop kind of, uh, I think that's year three, and that's an installation at the Venice Biennale. So that's this kind of new project of making encaustic tiles, which is now one of their primary products. And then again, just the images on the right, which just show, get a, give a bit of a sensibility of the kind of the variety of work and products and projects and installations that the workshop now gets involved with. And, and, it, and I think it was just really, I think a little, I think it sort of shares a similarity with our earlier projects and that it was kind of seeing the platform of the Turner Prize as an opportunity to kickstart a new idea. And so we knew that it was actually only going to be starting with a very small amount of funding, which was the money they gave you to um, do an installation for the show. But actually, if we could launch at the exhibition and we could start selling project uh, products, we could you know, raise enough money to make the workshop sustainable for its first year. And that, you know, and that and that was achieved. And then the question became, you know, what's next? And so it's been growing from that point ever since. It's a fantastic project. I mean, uh, just an, um, such a brilliant, inspiring project. I mean, what was it? I have to ask the really obvious question, but what was it like to win the Turner to Turner Prize? You know, and you were, I think you are, you were, and you are still the youngest winners ever. Um, you know, you're a collective winning a Turner Prize. There was a lot of debate about what art was, whether this was eligible, et cetera, all that sort of stuff. Um, what, what was that like? Well, it, look, it was a totally amazing moment. And I think, you know, more, more almost than the sort of evening of winning was the evening of the opening of the exhibition, which happened a few months earlier. Um, and that was the evening when we went up to Glasgow, but actually all our families came up to Glasgow too. And we had this, you know, big dinner all together. And it was the first time that, you know, some of you know, some of our families had, had met and it just felt really special and that we'd kind of built this quite unique community amongst ourselves. And that it was, it was really taking us to places which we hadn't expected. And I think again, back to my earlier point, you know, this mm. was hard enough to comprehend as a group, you know, and, and certainly not something we would have done as individuals. And it was, I think, just a moment which really solidified that as a feeling. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a tremendous achievement. Um, I think I'm gonna push us on to the next part, the last part actually, which is the next meal. We're gonna have to um, perhaps just sh sh pick one, one project, but perhaps um, just as a, a segue into that. Um, so, you then went to do a scholarship at Harvard, right? Or a fellowship at Harvard. Is it fellowship or scholarship? Fellowship. Yeah, the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard. And this is about you now journeying and thinking of, and sort of taking your career or your interests or your experiment forward. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because that obviously that's involved leaving Assemble as well. Yeah, right? no, exactly. So um, as I said, really, I think that Assemble was 
the most extraordinary sort of vessel and platform for uh, you know developing form of practice uh, for of experience um, and of developing a set of interests and that you know it's something that I started um, the year after finishing my undergrad so I've been doing it for a long time Is and it years? I think years? basically 10 years yeah and I'd had you know what was a big personal achievement for me which I've been working I'd been sort of leading the design of the new Goldsmith Center for Contemporary Art and that had basically been a four-year project and that mm -hmm. opened at the end of 2018 and was you know an amazing experience and very you know rewarding to, to be building kind of permanent public infrastructure but you know I think the kind of the four years is the key which is these projects became increasingly significant commitments as architectural ones were and you know I think I felt I was almost coming to the end of a relationship with that project with Goldsmiths and that I had begun to and I was thinking about what was next for me and my career and where I kind of wanted to be developing my skills and expertise and I, I think I'd felt for a while that they probably lay beyond what were you know kind of traditional conceptions of architecture and so I was really keen to kind of test out what that meant and one way of me thinking about that was I was really interested in an idea of scale but it was kind of clear to me personally that scale didn't mean bigger and bigger therefore mm. I wasn't interested in building a building that was larger than one before but I was interested in scale in terms of impact and how you could reach more people and mm. you know how some of these themes that I've been talking about like how do you uh, democratize access or knowledge or content how could I begin to explore what those meant for me and that was like a really it's a really big question to ask um, and um, I was you know really fortunate so I applied for the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard which is a fellowship offered for people who've worked for positive social impact in the um, in the built environment and I was you know lucky enough to receive that and so what that kind of opened up for me was really an extraordinary year of exploration at Harvard, which was an opportunity to kind of re-engage with, uh, you know, an academic environment and to take classes and things which I never thought about before, from digital government to scaling technology ventures to uh, public narrative, adaptive leadership. Um, and it was a view into a new type of education, which I found totally thrilling and exciting um, and, has, and has been very thought provoking in terms of thinking, you know, how do I synthesize this back into, you know, a set of ideas which will be, uh, you know, ultimately delivered in projects of, you know, in various forms. Fantastic. And one of your, I think one of your next meal, I think you picked out two or three, but let's share one. Um, one of your next meal um, projects that you were going to pull out was something that you were involved with or you saw at that, at that fellowship, is that right? This is an example of um, one of the classes that I took, um, which was actually in international negotiations. And it was led by an amazing teacher called Robert Wilkinson. And as someone like, you know, I just had a design background. I studied architecture for undergrad and postgrad. And there are all these subjects which um, I, I, to be honest, not even thought about, but but kind of uh, realizing that there are you know, very developed frameworks and theories around and engaging with them um, was, was a real privilege. And um, I think that, you know, for negotiation was, I think, one of the best examples for me of something which sits both at this level. We, we were doing international negotiation, so it was really around ideas around diplomacy. Mm. Um, but, but actually it became, it's very personal, like the same ideas about why two, you know, ideas around why two countries won't speak to each other are very similar to why two people won't speak to each other. And actually, again, that's where this idea of sort of scale comes in, because um, I suppose, you know, people's motivations or what drives them or what excites them or what upsets them um, are very similar and across the, that sort of scale and spectrum, but obviously become also, uh, you know, uh, more complex as you kind of increase the number of players. And I just found it totally fascinating, which is why I brought it in. Like it, 
it was for me the year was such an important reminder of getting outside of your discipline and engaging in some way with the depth um, that other disciplines offer because it just brings you know new ideas new provocations and actually you know picking up on uh, you know I feel like you know a question that Mona would have would be about like new projects like I think for people looking to initiate new work and new projects the best place to go is to go into other environments because mm. I think it's unbelievably generative of you know of new possibility. Um, I'm going to go back to a question which Dan asked a little while ago which I think was interesting it's sort of it's sort of um uh, around the context of Yardhouse but around also these people you were doing this fellowship with and this uh these other experiences is um is the, the working with different principals in the same office um who are doing different things such as graphic designers architects strategists um do you think this can further the reach and sort of um uh, change, change the dimension of the work what what do you feel about that sort of multidisciplinary idea well, I actually, I think that in many ways, Assemble is not that multidisciplinary. The majority of people have a background in architecture, mm. um, although I think people do have different capabilities and interests. Um, I think that, you know, there is a measure, of, and, and that, has, that has value, I think, particularly when it's kind of quite clear that you're trying to develop spaces when obviously you need those expertise. Um, I think it's unbelievably valuable to have people from lots of different disciplines and, um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I think there are sort of few companies that you would go into today or organisations where you didn't, uh, you know, find people from many different fields and I think that's great because I think that create, you know, I think people want to, it means that you're not competing um, and that you have a kind of sense, you know, you want like a project to have a sense of mission and then you want to have a sense of mission and purpose within that. And ideally that's all happening within a company who's like, you know, vision you're also really aligned with. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I basically am always encouraging people, you know, to try to uh, set up situations where they're working with people with you know, different backgrounds, different skills, different perspectives, because I just think that is what is, you know, generative of new ideas. Yeah, fantastic. Um, last question um, is, so you, I, I, I looked up your LinkedIn page this morning and call yourself a social entrepreneur. Um, and uh, it's very clear that um, across all the phases of your career that you've talked about, you've got themes and those themes are, um, you know, things that, you're looking to build on in different contexts as you go through, you put yourself in different situations. So in the, in the assemble situation or in the, the, the lobe situation, or now as an individual practitioner, you know, working with different projects, you know, you're interested in, as you say, sort of democratizing access to information, entertainment or experience, you know, making sure that can happen. Things that are sometimes for some people can happen for more people. That's, that's very clear. Um, and I suppose there's a social dimension to that. And I was going to ask about that. Is it, is it a creative person's responsibility to engage with the social impact of their work? Is that something you feel um, is important right now? And how can, a young, how can a young creative person start to engage with that, with that subject or that purview? It's really, that's a really interesting question. I, I think it's personal, really. Honestly, I'm a, I'm a pluralist. Like, I believe there are so many um, ways to be and ways to be creative. And I love that there is difference in that. And like, you know, I can, I, you know, I, I feel that I err on the side of the serious sometimes. And like, I love the person who can just do the playful. Like, that is such a joy and something which I think you know I wish I was like sometimes a little bit more capable of like it's, and so and so I just think I think there's joy and value in all of it and I think that you have to decide what matters to you like of course the social is important um of course there is you know there are um, you know incredible needs that need to be met and there are difficult questions to be answered around you know, countless ideas, uh, you know, and, and I don't think any, you know, any person can take on all of those. So you're always going to be making a decision on what matters most to you. 
and what you also think you're most capable and enjoy doing the most. And so mm. I don't think that there are, and I, and I think that also some things like sit with a kind of label that says socially, you know, social impact heavily kind of branded on them. But actually there are so many things which, you know, kind of defy classification, but ultimately fulfill that value. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like what is the, what is the social value of humor? And these things which are kind of in some ways harder to label, um, but like obviously intrinsically valuable to like how we live and how we enjoy life. And so I think that, you know, what is, I think that that variety is important. Like I want to see people doing all of it, <laughs> but I don't want to prescribe that people should be addressing it in a particular way. Right, right. That's really great advice, I think. Well, fantastic advice right across the, um, the uh, conversation. Thank you so much, Paloma. Um, I think it's time, it's nearly seven, so I've got to wrap up before we turn into pumpkins. So um, just some thanks. So first of all, to Felix Townsend, who created the wonderful um, uh, dinner with identity with all the, um, the noodles and forks and pepper shakers and all that sort of stuff. And then there's the brilliant um, Yuri Suzuki and his team. Uh, to thank um, my partner Yuri at Pentagram who created uh, the wonderful intro and outro music made with knives and forks and pots and pans um, and thank you for everyone for coming to dinner um, with us tonight and for all of your questions and of course thanks to the um, incomparable Paloma Strelitz. So um, if you either want to watch this again because that is that was just rich with amazing stuff that Paloma gave us today and if you wanted to watch it again, or I know quite a few people have come to it, um, uh, what, have not seen it the first time, but have seen it recorded, this will be up on DNAD's site in a matter of days. Um, and then if you'd like uh, to come to another dinner in March, um, come and have dinner with my brilliant Pentagram partners, Jody Hudson-Powell and Luke Powell on uh, Wednesday, April the 21st. Uh, so just under a month. Um, and in the meantime, thank you so much, Paloma. That's been fantastic. And um, everyone, see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.